So hello, Christine. Uh, as you know, so today is uh, International Women's Day. And um, besides that, all the activism that I do on the women's side, like, you know, that I am quite a sepsis activist uh, as a sepsis scientist. And basically today I wanted to interview you because as I have mentioned before, um, I'm one of your great admirers, uh, admirers, and um, so because I know you're a very, you know, strong woman and a, a true sepsis warrior, basically from all fronts. Um, so yeah, so basically, I just wanted to get, you know, to know you here live for everybody to to hear more about you and all the great work that you do, um, despite all the challenges and life challenges that you know life has thrown at you in in some way. Um, so yeah, so let's let's start right there. And uh, so if you can tell us a bit more about you know who is Christine Caron, um, you know, in, from all fronts. <laughs> uh, well, I have a background in marketing communications and uh, uh, and health and safety, and I'm the single mother of four young adults now, and I'm a dog lover. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mom, I'm a daughter, I'm uh, all those things. Awesome. Great. So now if we move a little bit more towards the sepsis side, like can you share with us a little bit more about your sepsis story, about, you know, everything that happened um, to you? Yeah, well, um, first off, I'd never heard of sepsis and neither had anybody in my family. So we'll start off with that. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't been feeling well. Um, for a few months, I'd been feeling quite myself for a few months. I'd been battling some bronchial stuff, and there was months in between, I'm going to say, infections. So uh, I hadn't been feeling quite myself for a little while. And it was May, and it was a beautiful, beautiful day, and I was outside playing with my dogs. This was in 2013. And we were playing tug of war, and one accidentally nipped my left hand. It wasn't an act of aggression. Uh, we were playing yeah. and we were both trying to secure the rope at the same time mm -hmm. and uh, it was just a slight break in my dermis a small break in my skin uh, because my pool was being opened this is why I was outside with the dogs I immediately washed my hand in the pool because of all the chemicals that were in there okay. and then I went into the kitchen and washed with soap and disinfected and did the whole uh, the whole thing and um, it just it didn't bother me. I, I never had pain from there. I never had any sign of infection. Uh, on the Sunday, I was starting to have dizzy spells. The, the day that this happened was a Thursday. And on the following Sunday, I had a couple of dizzy spells. Uh, but I had a doctor's appointment lined up for the, the Monday. So I wasn't concerned at all. And I thought I would get a tetanus shot. Because I couldn't remember the last time I had a tetanus yeah. shot. Um, well, my appointment was canceled. Uh, my doctor had an emergency and uh, the appointment was cancelled. And uh, the next day I went out for my morning run and I got a dizzy spell and I came home, I showered, I was fine. I dropped my kids off at school and I went to work. And about 9.30 it was like somebody punched me in the stomach. Uh, I all of a sudden was nauseous, uh, I was dizzy. Uh, I told my, my co-worker, honestly, I feel like shit, I have to go home. And on my way home, I debated, should I just go to the hospital or... And I thought, well, it's not that bad, I'll go lie at home. And I lay down on the couch and I woke up at 3 o'clock when my son came home. He said I was breathing funny. So uh, I said I was fine and uh, tried to get to the after-hours clinic, but I slept too late again. And um, I walked into the emergency room the following morning and collapsed. So, I woke up a month later. <coughs> Excuse me. I woke up to the news that all of my limbs had been affected and my face. They wanted to amputate my forelimbs. My kidneys had shut down. Um, my nose had collapsed on one side and my upper lip was stuck to my nose. When I woke up, I was like this. This was scar massage that brought down my lip. Um, again, none of us had heard the word sepsis. Um, I was transferred to hospitals in my coma. And my family had never heard the word sepsis at their first hospital. And uh, only at the second. At the first hospital, they only talked about a dog bite. Uh, but it turns out that that was the catalyst 
uh, that caused me to go over into sepsis because it was later found out that I had pneumonia. Mm -hmm. um, it was bacterial infection either way. Um, the planets aligned. It was the perfect storm because if one didn't get me, the other one was going to get me. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually had mean people say it was, uh, uh, oh, what do they call that? When you get bad vibes sent back at you. But I believe that I was um, uprooted. Um, the people that I've met on this journey are absolutely incredible. And uh, there is a need for people to talk about sepsis. It seems that even the press are af afraid of using the word. Yeah. Um, I was reading a history of sepsis, and it was in 1900 that it was discovered. And I don't understand why there's so many cases and so many people are dying. Mm -hmm. So here I am, yeah. <laughs> banging on tables. Despite all of doors. that, yes, yes, <laughs> moving forward, which is important. Um, so, I mean, I, you are a miracle in a way, right? Like, so you, you were able to go through all of that and still be here. Um, how was the doctor's approach after you left the hospital? Did they explain you, you know, all the things that could happen afterwards? You know, like uh, some sort of like, you know, medical care support, you know, understanding of all the symptoms that you might have been having afterwards. Um, I mean, besides obviously like the obvious care because of, of how your limbs were affected, but like, you know, the typical things or signs that could happen afterwards because of you have, because you have sepsis. Um. Olga, you'd be shocked. I was told by uh, social work and uh, psychology and the surgeons that there was no information on sepsis available, that I would have to do some research when I got out. There was nothing they could hand me. I was not told about post-sepsis syndrome. Um, I myself was lucky enough to be transferred immediately from um, trauma. I, so I did quite a bit of time in ICU, then I went into trauma. And then um, right after my last surgery, I was transferred to the rehab center directly. I didn't spend any time at home in between or in a residence, which is happening to a lot of sepsis survivors. Um, so I was under the care of one of the best physiatrists, I'm going to say in the country, because I've spoken to many people. And this woman was all about the future. Anytime I tried to slip into the past, she refocused me on the future and um, she's a physiatrist so her job was really to keep my body balanced and get me up walking and get me as independent as possible which as a single parent yes, as a woman mm -hmm. was so important to me mm -hmm. um, I don't think I would have gotten as far as I did without Dr. Dudak uh, hands on Mm -hmm. And I was in the rehab center from July until December. Mm -hmm. And I do not believe that I would have made it mentally um, through what we thought was post sepsis. Uh, no, what we thought was only, and I say only, a post traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. which is horrible on its own. Yeah. Throw in some post sepsis syndrome, and you've got another a major event happening in somebody's life um, and I'd like I've mentioned before I'd love to see the statistics on how many people get through their first two years yes um, because I know of cases that they haven't mm -hmm. um, because the trauma and stress and not knowing what was going on with them was too much mm -hmm. uh, sepsis alone is too much mm -hmm. to deal with because you're talking about people who are healthy. These are people that were running every day. People who did marathons. People who, and they wake up not able to lift their arm. Mm -hmm. um, I read a story recently about a woman who'd run a marathon before she was hit with sepsis. And I was running myself. And I believe that all that running and all that yoga that I was doing prior to my illness was preparing me for this marathon. Yes. Because had my heart not been in the health that it had been in, I would not have made it. Definitely. And my lungs, I had pneumonia, mm -hmm. but my lungs were strong enough that they did not give out. I had one respiratory failure, yeah. which one, mm -hmm. you know, I'd say I only had. <laughs> yes. And when I woke up, I said, are you going to tell me that one little coma can destroy all my muscle tissue like this? And the doctors burst out laughing. 
little coma. It's <laughs> almost like saying I'm a little bit pregnant. Yes. You know <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes. Definitely. So okay, so it was fantastic you have your physiatry support. Um, however you say that you didn't know anything about sepsis, neither your family. So if you would have known, you know, or if you would have gotten more information at the time, you know, would that first year after you went home, how would it have been different? Like you think that knowledge would have empowered you in a way well, to kind of prepare you? Well, your hair, Olga, your hair comes up, starts coming out in chunks. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not sleeping, you're having nightmares. All of a sudden, you got to remember this was months after I'd suffered what I did suffer. Yes. Um, and I'm told that, um, actually, one of the things that helped me get through my first year, too, is um, somebody contacted me because I had a, found I had a fundraiser mm -hmm. um, because I was caught totally off guard by this, right? Yes. And as most people are. Um, somebody's mother contacted me and said that her son had suffered a sepsis and he was really having a hard time. And that once I was at a hospital, I reached out to him. And I thought to myself, is she crazy? I'm sick myself. Like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Anyhow, I happened to meet her son at rehab. And he turned into what I call my sepsis brother. Mm -hmm. um, because I hadn't realized yet that I had suffered sepsis. Yeah. Everybody kept saying dog bite. And I knew this wasn't the case. Um, because I did read um, the cat, no, whatever the name is long like this for the dog bite syndrome. Mm -hmm. And had it been that I would have been dead by Saturday, uh, to two days thing. And if you actually read the defi definition of that, um, cause of whatever, um, it's sepsis, it's sepsis, it's a uh, bacteria enters your body and poof, you are in septic shock. Mm -hmm. They gave it this fancy name, but it's sepsis. Um, Dean and I went through uh, losing our fingers together, um, and we both were hit with post-sepsis syndrome at the same time. So I had somebody to share my story with, and we didn't even know we were suffering post-sepsis syndrome. Yeah. But at least I had somebody that I could talk with, and he was suffering the same thing I was. So even if the doctors couldn't put a name on it, we knew we were not losing yes. our minds because it was we were going early. through the same challenges and you support yes. each other basically yes and yes. even though the doctors were going well there's no real reason for that it's probably just because of whatever we couldn't balance our body heat our hair was falling out and in dean's case he suffered a stroke while in rehab wow. so and which we found out later on was also something that you're at higher risk for Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody should have been watching for. Yes, yes, definitely. That's, uh, that's what now. Now, sepsis is the gift that keeps on giving. Exactly, it, it lasts. It lingers. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so it is clear that you are a, a sepsis warrior. You know, like, and can and I, I, I am. I know basically what all the you know sepsis activism that you have been doing. But can you tell our ad audience today, like, you know, all the things that you have been doing since then and you know, how you're empowering other sepsis survivors and sepsis family or affected families by sepsis? Well, I've, um, I've started working with the Amputee Coalition of Canada and I visit uh, new amputees, whether it's by accident or by sepsis. And uh, because the peer visit also was a, a key stepping stone for myself to see that people could actually have a life after amputations. Um, and then I saw that it was very clear that Dean and I were still supporting each other um, uh, via Facebook and Messenger. And uh, and then I met another sepsis survivor who suffered sepsis from a tooth abscess. And he was so young. And uh, he has a young son. And uh, then I met my friend Diane. I was asked to speak in Halifax. And she had started a small group, which we have kicked off. Uh, her and her best friend had started a group called the... Uh, as sepsis survivors Canada, but even then they didn't even know about post sepsis syndrome when they started this. Mm -hmm. Diane was alone, yeah. and uh, this was a way to try and connect her with some other people, and it just seemed to spread from there. And then we got uh, heard word. Um, I'm going to say I did hear about the Cat Sepsis Foundation, um, but every time we made a approach, I mean you guys were still building and growing. 
Yeah. So uh, this is why this launch or event of March is so exciting yeah. because bring us out into the the open and the new, and uh, so that people see that there's actually an issue, and that we're real, and that we are out there to change things. Yes. And, uh, I don't know. Those who do know me, I will kick doors and I will be banging on them because yeah. I don't want any more babies exactly. or parents to die. Yes. Um, it's okay. it's it's a horrible, horrible thing. It's so sudden that people don't have time to get their mind around it. And often, when people are left with a loss, they are in shock and still years later don't know what happened to their yes, loved one yes, exactly. because honestly we're not being told anything mm -hmm. exactly yeah so i i like i said i mean I, I, the same way i admire you i i, I admire diane like I, I have been quite kind of like you know involved a little bit in with all these uh facebook groups and i i remember when basically diane started like i can see her activism as well like you know posting regularly and trying to do as much as he can like and then you know like basically seeing your power and your motivation and your activism is what empower people i guess like and and personally that's how empower me as a sepsis scientist in a way to kind of you know keep moving forward and keep doing something about you know trying to to discover the dips and and, and bits of of this horrible condition right like uh, I, I was personally affected as well as you know like my dad died from sepsis as well so as a family member i have gone through all uh the, the really low downside of, of this condition so basically that's what keep fueling me and, and moving forward to kind of be be able to see some kind of advancement at least in my lifetime you know uh, not just from the awareness perspective which is something as well as you know i do with the canadian sepsis foundation as a volunteer um but as well you know from the diagnostics from the treatments from the approaches that are the care the healthcare approaches that are given to the patients even when they leave the hospital, you know, that they are, you know, well, um, not only well aware, but, you know, that they're well followed in terms of, like, the possible risks that they are in place uh, for, for patients with sepsis, which, again, we're not. And this is what we are trying to, you know, keep, at least here in Canada, because as we all know, um, the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, and Australia basically have very strong sepsis foundations. Um, that have been doing quite a lot of activism and trying to put, you know, policies in place to keep moving forward and have more numbers because <coughs> statistics matter at the point of convincing policymakers to kind of start doing changes in the way um, that, that you know, the healthcare approaches that are given to patients is, is being put into practice. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, like, we just need to get together and, you know, from all perspectives, patients scientists clinicians healthcare workers um and then just you know keep fighting to to advance in, yeah in that, in that sense i have to give a shout out to uh, the sepsis alliance because uh, they were the only source of information yes when going through and i was handing it out to absolutely anybody i could um their fact sheets are written in plain english and everybody can relate to one yeah. of the fact sheets so you are plugged in mm -hmm. you know you feel yes indeed. not alone oh my god look at this mm -hmm. and as myself as a canadian there was nothing in canada but to find canadians on that site yes uh, the faces of sepsis but again not only did i find canadians but i discovered how uh, widespread it was and how um how would you say uh, sepsis doesn't care how old you are oh yeah um, kind of some of the stories way. i'm still haunted by and i had no idea that little babies were suffering the same suffer that we were suffering which is silly on my part to think that only adults would have it but i was shocked at the stories of a child coming home with a scratched knee i'm a mother mm -hmm. i how many times could this have happened to me yeah to my children mm -hmm. that i had no idea none mm -hmm. like you're sitting there going oh my gosh i put my child to bed after that surgery yes. oh my gosh this could have yes. you know the what ifs and what could have been are slapping you in the face Indeed. 
Indeed. We we need to get more information out there. Definitely, definitely. So, what what message would you give to sepsis survivors and and families affected by sepsis today? Well, that they're not alone, and that uh, look out there. There's other people like yourselves, and um, we are doing what we can to change this so this doesn't happen to anybody else. Yes, you're not alone. Yes, indeed, indeed. We are in all, <laughs> we're in this all together, right? Like we, we, we are, are, yeah, we are. yeah, yeah. Just take all of us to yes. get this changed. Yes, exactly. We've got to get some training and. Indeed. So uh, as to close our interview, I mean, as you know, I mean, I, I made this interview specifically today because today is International Women's Day and you are a woman and you are a sepsis survivor. So basically this entrench or, or, you know, and, um, bring together the two major passions that I have, which is the, uh, basically sepsis and fighting for gender equality and, you know, and empower men and women. So what you know, you think of any possibility of, of, of policies, you as a sepsis survivor and as a woman that, you know, will basically um, empower in that, in that sense, you know, or bring these two, two links to, to think these two things together. Well, independence is so important, as you know. So um, I, I know this isn't just for women, but um, as a person with some disabilities, um, finding a bathroom that I can get into with a wheelchair is not always easy. People think that uh, when they see that the bathroom is a little bit wider, uh, they think, well, okay, everything is accessible here, but often you can't get in the door mm -hmm. of the bathroom exactly. with your wheelchair to get into that bathroom. Or um, a lot of the older shops in Ottawa, because we have a lot of the older buildings that are you can't get into without these super high steps to get in. And as a mother with a children with a stroller, it's the same the same issue. As a sepsis survivor, I'd like to see more protocols and and uh, attention um, focused on women uh, when they come into the ER, and not that they're just whining. Check them for a UTI. Um, we have a woman in Ottawa that lost her twins because of a UTI. She was sent home. Um, she lost her uterus. She can't walk anymore. Um, take it seriously. Um, pregnant women, if they start complaining a little bit more than they normally would, look. Look for something else. Yes. Uh, they need to have some policies. It's, t it's t 2019. I don't think that women and children should be in childbirth anymore. And or by the flu, yes. you know, the flu when we were kids, you know, I remember having a discussion. Boy, when my grandmother was living, was younger, can you imagine they died from the flu? Yes. That's happening again. Yes. So, you know, we just need to be more aware and get more training, and it'll all fall into place. Indeed. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for, for being here today, uh, Christine, with us. And uh, I mean, it, it's my pleasure and my honor, basically, to be able to interview you. Um, and, and I know you are a great um, example, basically, for many sepsis survivors uh, to keep, you know, pushing forward no matter what, um, and always be positive and seeing the health glass full because that's the way basically I see you, right? Like you're always looking into the positive direction of things. So thank you so much, and um, hopefully we can do this again at some other point. <laughs> That'd be excellent. Awesome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay. Bye bye.